I introduced Acts 21 last week by saying it's a difficult chapter. In studying it a little bit more, I have come to the conclusion that it's probably the most difficult chapter in uh, the book of Acts. It's not because it's hard to understand, but because it kind of hurts our feelings a little bit. As we go through this chapter, this, uh, we, we always, I, I was talking with Steph yesterday about this, this chapter. And we always think of the Apostle Paul as right, right? We, we think of, uh, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Because why? Because he followed Christ. And, and the Apostle Paul used greatly of God and, and used uh, in, in great ways to found churches and to write scripture and to encourage believers, to train pastors. He was greatly used of God. And, and here we come to chapter 21 of Acts, and I believe it contains a blunder on the part of the Apostle Paul at the end of his third missionary journey. Look with me just quickly by way of review at verse 4. In verse 4, the Apostle Paul arrives in the city of Tyre, so he's in Syria, just above the land of Israel. He arrives in Tyre, and he's told by the believers who are there, and you see there, it says, In finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul these next three words, Through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul was told by men who were led by God, the Holy Spirit was enabling them and told them what to say, these men told Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. In verses 10 through 12, the Apostle Paul has come from Tyre down to Caesarea in, in the land of Israel. So he's come out of Syria into Israel. And he's told by a prophet named Agabus that if he goes up to Jerusalem, he's going to be captured. He's going to be arrested. He'll be bound if he goes up there. But Paul is determined to go to Jerusalem, come what may. And I do want to stress again, and I'll stress this several times throughout this message, my purpose is certainly not to find fault in Paul's motive at all. If you look at verse 13, he plainly states, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul is sold out for Christ. I don't find fault with his motive. I'm not judging his heart. But a literal interpretation of this passage requires that we say he was told expressly by men who were said that they were speaking through the Spirit not to do something, and then he did it. Which shows us that the Apostle Paul was man. He was flesh. He's made out of the same stuff as we are. The Apostle Paul sinned from time to time. I believe that this right here is a step out of line. Paul has suffered much for the cause of Christ, even by this point in his ministry. No one's questioning his heart for God, merely the wisdom of a choice that he would make that would end up in his losing his freedom to minister for the next five years. The decision that Paul makes in Acts 21 will, the rest of the book of Acts will be shaded by this decision. The rest of Paul's ministry will be shaded by this decision. He will be a prisoner. He will be uh, in chains for much of the, the rest of his life because of this decision. In verse 15, Paul and his companions make the trip from Caesarea to Jerusalem where he receives a welcome reception. He's, he's warmly welcomed by the believers of Jerusalem. Look with me at verse 17 where we'll pick up this morning. And when we... The fact that Luke is saying we means he was with Paul. There's a whole group of people. It's not Paul and Luke. It's Paul and Luke and Trophimus and some, some other men who were traveling with him to come back. They come to Jerusalem. The brethren received us gladly, verse 18. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James. And all the elders were present. If you remember... The Apostle Paul was certainly a sight for sore eyes for the believers there in, in Judea because there was a famine going on that had been predicted way back in Acts 15 that there was going to be a famine. They were struggling. And at the end of Paul's third missionary journey that we were looking at in the previous chapters, he was collecting a, an offering. You remember this? He was going around uh, Asia Minor and then Macedonia and Achaia and then back into Asia Minor. And he was collecting monies 
from the Gentile believers to go and be a blessing to their Christian brothers and sisters in Christ in Judea. And by doing that, it would be a tremendous sign of the unity that is there in Christ. When the Gentiles are helping the Jews, it shows we're, we're all one in Christ. We're one body. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, bond or free. We're, we're, all, we're all there in Christ. So Paul comes not only with the material blessings to ease their burden, but with exciting news about the work that God has been doing in the north and the west. He's, he's got a whole list. We have what, Paul, what, what was written down of Paul's third missionary journey by Luke. But we certainly don't have all of the stories written. And so Paul comes back and he's sharing with these believers, we'll see in a moment, He's sharing with the believers in Jerusalem all that God has done. And he's, he's excited because God is doing great things. Churches are being planted. The day after their arrival, Paul and his companions go to meet with James and the elders that were present in Jerusalem. Now, this is not James, the son of Zebedee. Uh, Ze Zebedee. We know James and John were the, were the sons of Zebedee. This is not that James, because that James was martyred by Herod in Acts 12. So he has since passed off the scene. There is another apostle named James, James the son of Alphaeus. We don't have a whole lot of information about him. He's called James the Less, because we know less about him. But it's more likely in this <coughs> passage that the James that is mentioned here in verse 18 is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. So one of Mary and Joseph's sons, Jesus' half-brother, who had been a leader in the church of Jerusalem since its inception. It is interesting to note, and this will kind of give some color to what we're going to look at in the next few moments. If this was, in fact, not James the son of Alphaeus, the apostle James, then there are no other apostles in Jerusalem at this time. There, none are mentioned in our passage, and they would have been. It's mentioned James and the elders. If, if the apostles were there, it would have been said, the other apostles. Where are the apostles? Talk back to me a little bit. I know it's Sunday morning, but you can talk back a little bit. Where are they? They're everywhere. They are taking the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. We believe that Andrew made it all the way up to Scotland. If you've ever seen Scotland's flag, the blue flag with the white X on it, that's called St. Andrew's Cross. The reason why is because it's believed that Andrew made it as far as Scotland, which that's a long way to go without benefit of mass transit, right? We believe that Thomas died in India. That's an, a long way to go without benefit of mass transit as well. But the, the apostles are spreading out over the face of the, the globe, not just the Roman Empire, but beyond taking the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 19. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. A progress report. When we have missionaries who come back to the States, we like to have them in, and they can say, hey, this is what happened. Paul is doing just such a thing. He goes to Jerusalem, and he says, let me tell you what God did in Corinth. Let me tell you what God's doing in Ephesus. Let me tell you what God is doing in Antioch of Pisidia. He's able to give all of this, this information. The church that was begun in Acts 2 in Jerusalem with a handful, 120 in the upper room, that quickly spread to the 3,000 who were saved on the day of Pentecost, and then the 5,000 who were saved a few days later, is now all over the world. And the believers are excited to hear all of this, all that God has been doing. But there's an interesting request, and this is where we get trouble. Again, last week we had Paul, again, taking, I believe, a misstep by going against the the express advice given by spirit-filled men. We find another issue here. Look with me. An interesting request is made in verse 20. And when they heard it, they, referring back to verse 19, or verse 18, the elders and James, so the leadership of the Jerusalem church, when they heard it, they glorified God, obviously, and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous for the 
flaw. Does that leave a bad taste in your mouth? That leaves a bad taste in my mouth. As I'm reading through, I see, why? When we read that there are thousands of Jews which believe, that's the Greek word pistuo, it means they're born again. These are Christians. The, the James and the other, the other leaders there, they say, hey, these are believing Jews and they're, they're zealous. That word means to defend and uphold, to follow with passionate devotion. The law. Now, I would read this entirely different if they said, we see how many thousands, and it's that word thousands is the word myriads. It means tens of thousands. James and the, the other elders, they say, Paul, it's great to hear what God's doing in the Gentile regions of Asia and Europe, but God's doing something here too. We have thousands of Jews who have trusted Christ and they're excited about the law. And, and that rubs me wrong because I wish it said that they were zealous for Christ. But that's not what it says. They're zealous for, for the law. Is the law sinful? No. no. Paul answers this question. In Romans 7, verse 7, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? He uses this, that, those two words, God forbid. That is the most stringent, the most powerful way of saying no. God forbid. Is the law sin? Absolutely not. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Law, the, the law is the equivalent of a, it's a speed limit sign. It tells you what you should have been doing. And, and when the police officer pulls you over, he's able to say, you are breaking the law because the law says do this and you were doing that. That's what the law of, of Moses does as well. It says you should be doing this, but you're doing that. It reveals sin. Galatians 3.24, I love the, 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 verb, the verbs that are used here. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We might be justified by faith. What is the point of the law? I, when we were going through Galatians, that was two years ago, by the way. <laughs> when we were going through Galatians, I told you it this way. The law is made to make you feel bad about yourself. That's the point of the law. You are supposed to read the law and say, boy, I don't add up. I need someone. I, I need a savior. That's the point. It's a schoolmaster to point us to grace. It's a signpost that says, you need a savior. These Jews here in verse 20, they've trusted Christ, but they are still practicing the ceremonial law. They're still observing the Sabbath, which would be the seventh day. <coughs> they're, they're following the, the prescription relating to vows and, and dietary restrictions and whatnot, which... By the way, and I'm going to ask you to talk back to me a little bit. Is it wrong for the Jews to observe the dietary restrictions? No. no. It's neither here nor there. Is it wrong for the Jews to circumcise their sons in accordance with the law? No, it's neither here nor there. The problem is when you start taking and you add the law to grace because it removes the grace part. When you start saying, in order to be saved, you have to trust Christ and whatever follows the end is wrong. And that's right here. We're not there. They're not saying that, but they're close. They're not zealous for Christ. They're zealous for the law. Look at verse 21. And they, they're, they're continuing to talk about, about Paul. They're describing, hey, we've got all these Jews. They're zealous for the law. And they are informed of thee, Paul, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither walk after the customs. Real quick, who provided most of the persecution and opposition to the Apostle Paul when he was ministering in Asia Minor and Europe? What group provided the most pushback? The Jews. We, you can't help but see that. He goes to the synagogue. The Jews are the ones who stir up the riots in the town for the most part. It's not exclusive, but 
most of his opposition comes from the Jews. The unbelieving Jews, specifically. And word has made its way back to Jerusalem from the far-flung corners of the empire that Paul was going around telling the Jews that they, you can forget about the law of Moses. You don't, you don't need to, it's, it's, a, it's a nothing. Now, nowhere in scripture do we have that recorded. We don't have any reference that we can point to where the apostle Paul tells the Jews that they should, they should set aside the law. Rather, he says the law serves a purpose. There's no place in scripture where the apostle Paul forbids them from circumcising their sons. Circumcision was the sign of Abraham, the sign of the covenant given to Abraham, and it was it's not a means of obtaining favor with God, but that's what the Jews had made it. They had taken it where if you're, if you're not circumcised, then you're not spiritual. You're not, you're not the, the real thing. The entire epistle of Galatians is written for this purpose. Paul did, however, tell the Gentiles that they did not have to be circumcised. If you remember... 1 Corinthians 7, verse 18, we read, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. What is Paul saying here? He says, look, when it comes to salvation, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not. The Jews, they made a big deal about it. You want to be saved? You need to be circumcised. Paul says no, no, it's, it's not about that. Circumcision is nothing. If, you're, if, you, if you saw Christ when you were circumcised, good. If you saw Christ when you were uncircumcised, good. It, it doesn't matter before Christ. Understand circumcision being the keeping of the law. In Acts 16, verse 3, we looked at this some months back, Paul had circumcised Timothy. As a, as a young man, Paul had circumcised Timothy after he trusted Christ. Not so that he would be saved, but because the Apostle Paul knew if Timothy is circumcised, it will open doors of ministry to him. It had nothing to do with, well, Timothy, I understand that you've trusted Christ and all, but, but in order to seal the deal, we need, we need to circumcise you. That's not what it was. It was Timothy, you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. God's called you to minister if you're circumcised, you'll be able to minister to more people than if you were uncircumcised. And so Paul took the step. In Galatians 1 and 2, Paul tells the Galatians believers that they were not saved by keeping the law of Moses. They're saved by following Christ. They're saved by grace through faith. Interestingly enough, the Apostle Paul, he circumcised Timothy. To broaden his audience. He did not circumcise Titus. For the same reason. Do you get the point here? I need a little bit of feedback. You get the point that circumcision. Is not a big deal when it comes to the gospel. You understand that right? You don't have to be circumcised to be saved. And Paul. Has been preaching that. All over the place. But word has trickled back. And you know what? You ever played a game when you were in elementary school. Whisper down the lane. And. And you whisper something in the ear of one child at the front of the class. And by the end, it's not even close. Well, a big game of whisper down the lane has taken place across the Roman Empire. As word of what Paul said makes its way by people all the way back to Jerusalem. Verse 22. This is still James and the elders addressing Paul. They say, what is it there for? The multitudes must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Paul, you're, you're something of a celebrity. The fact that you're here is going to draw a crowd. We need, to get these, we need to get these questions ironed out. James and the elders of Jerusalem see a problem on the horizon. Paul, we've got all of this conflicting information as to what you've been preaching. We've, we've been told that you told the Jews that, that they don't have to, to, to be circumcised in, in all of this. Paul is here in Jerusalem. There's going to be an uproar among the Jews because of the misunderstanding. To put it in words that we would use, Paul, Paul, you're, you're here and people are going to come to see you. 
How can we prevent a storm against the Jewish believers and the Jews who have not yet re been reached with the gospel? That's their, that's their motive. Here's their solution. You see, the pro it's a mess, isn't it? That's why I said this is a tough passage. Let's look at their solution. If you thought the problem was bad, wait till you see the solution. Do, therefore, this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Take them, or them take, and, and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things, wherefore they are informed concerning thee, are nothing. And that thou thyself also walkest orderly, and keepest the law. Oh boy, there's a lot there. In Jerusalem, there are four believing Jewish men who have taken a vow upon themselves. We assume that it's a Nazarite vow. We don't have that on authority, but probably that's why it talks about the shaving of the head. That was with Nazarite vows. They, they've taken this vow, and the time of their vow, you would take a vow for a particular period of time, and during that time, there were certain restrictions. If it was a Nazarite vow, you could eat nothing that came from a grape. You couldn't, you couldn't drink wine or juice. You couldn't partake of raisins or... Nothing that was a derivative of a grave. You couldn't touch dead bodies. You couldn't cut your hair. You couldn't shave your face. These were the, the restrictions upon a Nazarite. It was taken for a period of time for most people. There are some famous Nazarites who were Nazarites from birth. Samson was one. Samuel was another. We have a few. John the Baptist. We have some who were, were long term. But most people took it usually for a month. So these four men in Jerusalem, they're coming to the end of their, their period of, of being on a vow. And at the end of the vow, at the beginning of the vow, you shave your head. At the end of the vow, you shave your head again. In, the, in between, you didn't touch your hair at all. You just let, you just let it go. It was part of the, part of the vow. <laughs> we can go into that later for, if, you're, if you're interested. Okay? They're coming to the end of their vow. They would not only shave their head, they would also offer animal sacrifices in the temple. They would go and they would offer sheep and, and, and these particular animals. And it was considered a sign of piety. It was considered a good thing. When a Jewish person knew of somebody who was taking a vow, they would somebody would come alongside them and they'd say, Hey, I, I hear you're taking a vow for this next month. I'd be honored to, to, to pay for your sacrifices. That was, that was a, considered a good thing. Many people did that, and that day was considered a, a way of, of showing piety. And so that's what the, the elders and James asked of Paul. They say, Paul, we want you to come alongside of these four men who are ending their vow, and we want you to take on their sacrifices, take on the expense of their sacrifices. The reasons for asking Paul to do this, that all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee, verse 21, are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. And we've been in Acts now for some weeks, so I want you to, to tell me, because you know, having read what we've read so far, these 20 chapters that we've covered fully, does Paul walk orderly according to the tradition of the Jewish fathers? No. Specifically, the Apostle Paul <coughs> eats with Gentiles. The Apostle Paul has been living amongst the Gentiles for, for some years now. Another question for you. Does Paul keep the ceremonial law of Moses? Not consistently he doesn't. It's not to say that he never does. But he doesn't consistently. Some examples. What day of the week does Paul worship on? Sunday. We have it all throughout the book of Acts. On the first day of the week, he's worshiping. Paul missed being in Jerusalem for the feasts. That's, that's breaking the law. Paul ate whatever was offered to him while ministering among the Gentiles. He didn't ask. Meaning, the Apostle Paul probably ate the occasional pork chop. Why? Because it was what was offered to him. And he didn't ask. And, and it was fine. Paul didn't offer animal sacrifices as prescribed by Moses. So, they are asking Paul, Paul, we want you to prove to everybody by paying these guys' expenses in their vow. We want you to prove to everyone that you're, you're still keeping the traditions, you're still following the law, and he's not. 
Now, it's not to say that the Apostle Paul, when he was by himself, he probably ate kosher. Probably. You know why? Because that's how he was raised. For the vast majority of his life, that's how he ate. The Apostle Paul, he, he had been raised a, a, a Jew of Jews. Hebrew of the Hebrews is how he describes it. But here, in this passage, he's being asked to prove something that just isn't the case. James and the elders acknowledge what they decided in the first church council back in Acts 15. Look at verse 25. They, they do, they say, we, we remember what we said. They say, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood, from strangled, and from fornication. So they're saying, Paul, look, we understand what we said. But when it comes to the Jews, it's important that the Jews believe that you still keep the law. It's important that the Jews believe that you follow the traditions of the elders. Back in December of last year, we looked in depth at Acts 15. So I'm not going to re-preach Acts 15 here this morning. Acts 15 records the first Jerusalem church council where the the, the apostles and pastors of the church, they, they help to maintain peace between the Gentiles and the Jews. What does Paul do with all of this information? What does he do in this, again, it's a messy situation. What does he do? Verse 26, then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. What did Paul do? He did what they asked him to do. I think you can make the case. I, I'm going to say it very, very gingerly. He compromised. This, what they're asking him to do is not a good thing. And he did it. Paul did exactly what was asked him by James and the leaders of the church. He went up to the temple. He participated in the vow taken by these four, these four Jewish men. And he offered animal sacrifices for each of them. Does that leave you feeling bad? It, it leaves me. I feel off when I'm reading this. Because I'm used to saying, well, we find what Paul's doing. And we're confident that's right. But in this case, in this whole chapter, I'm, I'm not confident that the Apostle Paul is right. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that he's off. Because of that, it's a difficult passage. So how did it work out? What were the results? Take a look at verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands upon him. This compromise for the sake of peace didn't even work. Notice who the culprits are. Do you see who it is? The Jews, which were of Asia. The same people who had caused problems for him in Lystra and Derbe and Iconium and Antioch of Pisidia. Those Jews, they had come back. Do you know why they were back? Because it's the feast. They were coming back for the Feast of Pentecost. And so these observant Jews have come back to Jerusalem where they're going to be offering sacrifices. And while these observant Jews, these men who are trying to earn their way to heaven, while they're there and they're offering sacrifices, one of them looks over and he's, that looks like Paul. Is that Paul? I think that's Paul. Hey, this isn't right. And they start a riot. Because the, his nemesis from Asia found him in Jerusalem. And they caught him in a compromising position. These are lost Jews that we're reading about here in verse 27. They're probably from Ephesus. I'll explain why in just a moment. They're probably from Ephesus. They were there to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. They recognized Paul and they start a riot. Look at verse 28. Here's what they're saying. Crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further brought Greeks also into the temple and had polluted this place. Verse 29 is in parentheses. It says, For they had seen before, seen him before in the city Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. 
they realized as they look at Paul in the temple, I saw him earlier. He was with Trophimus, who is an Ephesian, a Gentile. I'll bet he brought a Gentile into the temple. Gentiles aren't allowed in the temple. There's the court of the Gentiles, which is the outermost ring. But Paul is a Jew, and he's able to go all the way into the inner courtyard, being a Jewish man. He's able to get as close to the actual temple as anyone is. These Jews, the reason we say they're from Asia is because they recognize, or from Ephesus is because they recognize an Ephesian, probably denoting where they're from. While compromising to appease the Jews in Jerusalem, Paul was accused of breaking the law even further. <laughs> they're not happy. Look at verse 30. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul, drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. This is reminiscent of the riot that took place in Ephesus with Demetrius, the silversmith. You remember that? All the Jews of Jerusalem, they're out for blood. This Paul has come here. He's teaching people against the law. He's brought Gentiles into the temple. So Paul is dragged into, out of the temple complex, and the doors are slammed shut behind him. And that's where we're going to leave Paul for this morning. But we're not done. I want you to hold on for just a minute because we need to, we need to get a good understanding of this. Do you feel the messiness of this chapter? It's rough, isn't it? I, I don't like this. This is not the, not the easiest passage to preach, again, because it's tough on, on our hero here. Let's talk for just a moment here about liberty and conscience, because that's what we're dealing with. There are several themes that need to be considered in connection with this passage. Again, I want to say it very, very plainly. My purpose is not to impugn the motive or heart of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is a more spiritual man of God than I am. He was greatly used of God, and so I'm not, putting, I'm not putting down his motive, and I'm not judging his heart. I certainly can't do that. Not being there, I, I could not possibly know. But I firmly believe that the decision that he made, right or wrong, here in this chapter, I believe they were made out of a heart of love for Christ. The Apostle Paul went up to Jerusalem because he loved Christ. The Apostle Paul made the decisions that he made because he loved Christ, but that doesn't make them right. Love of Christ is not the answer. Obedience is what God is looking for. Because to obey is better than sacrifice. You remember from 1 Samuel, to hearken in the fat of rams? Okay. That's what we're talking about here. I'm not judging the Apostle Paul. I'm not judging his motives, but I do have his actions, and his actions make me very, very uncomfortable because they go against what God has said. There are some who look at this passage. There are many. If you go home, and I would encourage you, go home, do your homework on this. Check it out. There are many who believe that in this passage, the Apostle Paul is just practicing what he preached in 1 Corinthians 9.20. Let me, let me read that to you. You're familiar with the passage. It says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, not being, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. Here's, the, here's what some people, they say, this is Paul just living this out. It says, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And there are many who would say the Apostle Paul is just practicing that passage here in Acts 21. <clears throat> Paul was willing, we know, to alter his, his personal preferences and curb his Christian liberty in order to reach people. When the Apostle Paul, as was his custom, when he would go into a synagogue to reach the Jews and tell them about their Messiah, he was not eating a ham sandwich as he did so. Why? Because that would have provided a needless roadblock. That would have provided a, a stumbling block to the Jews. Was there anything wrong with the ham sandwich? No. He could eat it with pure conscience, but it would hinder his his. Jewish brethren, according to the flesh, it would hinder them from hearing him. So we know that the Apostle Paul was willing to curb his, his 
spiritual liberties for the sake of others. We also need to remember that the book of Acts is written during a period of transition. Christ fulfilled the whole law, and those who were born again live under grace. But old habits die hard. And, and I, can, I can have grace for these people as well. It's also worth mentioning that we're within a decade of none of this mattering. Because within a decade, the temple would be destroyed. And, and no sacrifices could be offered anymore. So it's definitely a period of transition. But Paul finds himself in a difficult position here in Jerusalem. Paul is the apostle to the Jews or the Gentiles. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. We know this from Romans. As the apostle to the Gentiles, his life was spent among the Gentiles. He's not been preaching for them to come to Moses. He's been preaching to the Gentiles, you need to come to Christ. The law of Moses serves a purpose. It points us to Christ. But it's not the end. Galatians 3.20, the Apostle Paul said, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. Paul did not compel the Galatians to keep the ceremonial law of Moses, nor any of the other Gentiles. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Here it is. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. There it is. Why didn't Paul go into Ephesus and say, hey, let me tell you about Moses. He went into Ephesus and he said, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Because why? Because Moses just points you to Jesus. The Apostle Paul told people of Jesus. Paul had not told the Gentile believers that they needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. Because you don't. You don't have to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. On the other hand, Paul is trying to keep peace with the Jewish believers as well. These Jews were born again, verse 20 tells us, but rather than being zealous for Christ, they're zealous for the law. This zeal for the law made them especially susceptible to the false doctrine of salvation through works. Paul listened to the counsel of James and the other leaders of the church in Jerusalem. He tried to smooth over the feelings of the Jews who were not yet ready to acknowledge the fact that the law was passed. Let me, let me visualize it for you here with a, with a couple slides. In Jerusalem, Paul is stuck in the middle between two groups. He's, he's right in the middle between, one, the Gentile Christians, to whom he has preached salvation by grace through faith without the law. And he's stuck on the other side by the Jewish Christians, who have trusted Christ alone, but they still place a high value on the traditions. Do, do you feel the tension this morning as we're reading this? I hope you do. I hope you feel it's, it's a tight spot. What would have been best? What, what is the ideal situation right here for Paul. The ideal situation would be, are you ready for this? This is really deep. The ideal situation would be for him to not be there, which would not have happened had he listened back in verse 4 and verses 9 and 10. The apostle Paul, according to these men who were led by the Spirit of God, he wouldn't have been in this tight spot had he listened. Compromise never works out, though, does it? We try to do it, and we are, we are pushed in the same direction to compromise. Never works out the way we think it will. Compromise muddies the waters. It makes it difficult for anyone who sees us compromise. Even if we don't cross into sin, those who are watching us may not be able to find the line so easily. Compromise is a problem. Compromise can confuse the issues to those who already have questions. Think with me for just a moment. What would the Gentile believers in Galatia think when they find out that the Apostle Paul was taken prisoner in the temple in Jerusalem in the midst of offering animal sacrifices? Do, do you see why that's a problem? It's just confusing. Compromise doesn't work. 
And compromise rarely goes far enough to bring peace anyway. It didn't work. Paul was in the temple trying to make peace, and it blew up in his face when the, when the Jews from Asia showed up, and everything just blows up. Paul is, we leave him in the, in the street at the hands of a mob. This morning, by way of application, this is a difficult passage, and again, it leaves us feeling off a little bit when it comes to Paul. We're used to two looking for where Paul is on an issue and saying, I'll stand right there because he said, follow me as I follow Christ. This passage leaves us with a feeling we're not used to in the book of Acts. We're accustomed to seeing Paul make right choices and, and God blessing those choices. But we mentioned it last week and it bears repeating again. God is going to use all of this to get glory to himself because perhaps in no other situation is it better shown the truth of Romans 8.28. That says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. That's Paul. The reason he's there is because he loves God. He's called according to his purpose. In verse 33, if you look ahead, Paul is going to be placed in chains. And in one form or another, the Apostle Paul will wear those chains for the next five years of his life. In spite of that, God is going to use him to witness to countless people on two continents and to pen several epistles that we still have today. What's the lesson for us out of this difficult passage of Scripture? One, one lesson that we need to get because we, we face the temptation, one lesson is compromise is dangerous. It never works out the way we envision Find God's will. Grasp the truth of God's word and stand firm against all pressures from within or without to back down or to compromise. The Apostle Paul, I can make the case from Scripture he shouldn't have been in Jerusalem. What should the Apostle Paul have done when James and the elders of the church said, hey, would you go off of these sacrifices? What should he have said? He should have said the same things that he said to the church in Galatia. That's not necessary. Because Jesus Christ offered once for all and the sacrifice is paid. But he didn't. And it leaves us with an unfortunate lesson here this morning that I hope we can take and apply to our lives. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we, we struggle with this passage that you've given us in your word. Lord, it's difficult. But Lord, the lessons remain. I pray that we would take them. I pray that we would apply them to our lives. Lord, as we face the calls to compromise on a regular basis, I pray that we would stand firm. I pray that we would follow the Spirit's leading. Lord, that will remove us from a good number of situations. But Lord, when we find ourselves in a tight spot, I pray that we would not do what comes easy, but that we would do what's right. Lord, if there's one here this morning who's never trusted you as personal Savior, they've never placed their, their faith confidence in that sacrifice that you made once for all and then rose from the dead, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they would get that set. I pray now that you would bless this time of invitation for your honor and glory.